I'm very pleased and honored to have the opportunity to introduce my sister, Mary Jo White, uh, as you, as Dan just said, the chair of the SEC. And Dan, I really want to thank you uh, uh, for one particular reason, well, for a couple of particular reasons. I, I've given a number of introductions in my role as dean and when I was executive director, uh, but this is a first which I owe you, Dan. I have never had the opportunity to introduce anyone shorter than I am. <laughs> and that's very hard to do. Uh, think of it. How many brothers get to introduce their sister, or how many sisters get to introduce their brothers? Think of the opportunity, <laughs> the opportunity to tell hundreds of people about all the times that your little sister ran to your parents to tell about every prank that was ever pulled, and all the pranks that were pulled. Pulled by her and run to the parents when I pull one on her. Uh, however, I decided that rather than talk about those, uh, I decided that that's probably not why you came tonight. Uh, so I decided I wouldn't say anything else about that. Um, in this brief introduction, uh, I will, for those of you who may not have had a chance to read the program, talk about just a very few of the highlights of Mary Jo's career. And I will be leaving out a number of high points in her career, uh, a number of awards that she has received, but I want to give you a little bit of a flavor for her career. Um, perhaps I'm a little bit biased as a brother, but I don't think so. I think Mary Jo was the perfect appointee for chair of the SEC. After working at the U.S. Attorney's Office for the Southern District of New York and the law firm of Debevoise and Plimpton, Mary Jo was appointed by President George H.W. Bush as the first assistant, as first assistant U.S. Attorney for the Eastern District of New York. She later became acting U.S. Attorney for the Eastern District of New York. And as I said, she's won many awards too numerous to mention here. Uh, in 1993, President Clinton appointed her U.S. Attorney for the Southern District of New York. She was noted for her tenacious prosecution of white collar crime and earning convictions against the terrorists responsible for the 1993 bombing of the World Trade Center. And then, as you know, in 2013, President Obama appointed her as chair of the SEC. Now, what does this tell us as to one reason why she's the perfect appointee to chair the SEC? This history indicates her bipartisanship. She earned the respect of the presidents, of presidents from both parties for the quality of her work and her fitness for the positions to which she was appointed. Now, I could have told you something about her tenacity before President Bush or Obama knew anything about it. And those of you who may have read the New Yorker article about Mary Jo uh, are aware of that. Uh, I'm five years older than Mary Jo. Um, and we, as children, would occasionally engage in athletic competitions against each other, particularly tennis and ping pong. So ranging from tennis, for which I can never remember beating Mary Jo even once, to ping pong, 
which I might have won one or two rounds of, I can testify personally to the tenacity of Mary Jo White. I am only glad that I was never, I'm glad for my client that I was never opposite her in the courtroom. Her success in the positions that she has had demonstrates another of her important traits. Uh, she now holds, and I've lost my place, um, uh, th there are many other uh, comments that I could make about Mary Jo's career, but that would make my introduction longer than her speech. So I will mention only one more, her independence. Independence is critical, not just for chair of the SEC, but in public service in general. For those, of, for those few of you, and I'm not, I tried to think of someone in this audience who might know both of us well, and I couldn't think of anyone. Uh, but for any of you who do, you know that Mary Jo and I do not always agree politically. However, I had to laugh when her appointment was announced and the fear was expressed that because in her private practice she had represented the types of people that she would now be called upon to regulate, that she would somehow favor those people because they were former clients. Those people simply don't know Mary Jo. I have sometimes said, only half jokingly, that she would prosecute me if I had violated the law in any area of her responsibility. Now, actually, I guess she would recuse herself because she, another of her traits is also her integrity, but she'd recuse herself and appoint someone who was the strongest possible advocate uh, against whatever I had done wrong. Um, so her independence and integrity are beyond reproach, and it is my honor to introduce my sister, of whom I am so proud, the chair of the Securities and Exchange Commission, Mary Jo White. I'm supposed to say thank you now <laughs> for that excellent introduction, uh, and I do thank you for that. Uh, I had no idea until tonight that um, my brother actually was hung up on his height. <laughs> I actually am not hung up on my height, so, but, but seriously, thank you, Carl, for that excellent uh, introduction. Uh, I was about to say, and I will say, I guess it isn't true. Uh, that having your brother introduce you is your worst nightmare. Uh, it, it wasn't that at all. Uh, you took some direction about what to say and not to say, but very little, actually, I have to say. Uh, but let me add that I'm also very proud of Carl and all that uh, you have accomplished, uh, including, uh, obviously, as your executive director, I think, for 16 years. Uh, so I couldn't be prouder uh, of Carl. I want to thank also uh, Dean Rodriguez. He is... Uh, your president and also as a leader of Northwestern Law School, a great friend of the SEC, uh, sponsoring, among other things, the Securities uh, Institute uh, every year, which is you know, one of the greatest gatherings of securities lawyer on the West Coast, actually, as, as it turns out. So uh, best of luck uh, to you as well. Uh, I truly am honored uh, to have been asked to be your speaker, your inaugural speaker, in your showcase speaker program. This is an impressive forum. Your entire annual meeting is an impressive forum for a serious discussion of the most important issues affecting law schools and the legal profession. And the theme of this year's annual meeting, legal education at the crossroads, is an apt description of really the critical juncture uh, that we are all facing in 2015. 
Now, many of the challenges confronting law schools today are obviously well known. Enrollment of first-year law students uh, has not been this low uh, since 1973, the year before I graduated from law school. And while the job market uh, for law school graduates has improved over the last few years, uh, the financial crisis resulted in fundamental structural and market changes for more than just our financial system. There have been lasting changes uh, to the legal job market uh, that may in the long run affect the educational choices of college graduates uh, and the economic models of many of our law schools. I know you are studying these changes carefully and strategizing uh, for really the new normal, I guess we have to call it, and the financial challenges that come with that new normal for both students and your institutions. Now one positive byproduct uh, of the market changes, however, has been the steady, perhaps actually slightly increased number of recent law school graduates employed in the public and public interest sectors. And the graduates going into public service roles are increasingly, as you know, subsidized in some fashion by grants from their law schools. Indeed, about a quarter of such jobs are supported by law school grants. This is a far cry from what was happening uh, when I graduated from Columbia Law School in 1974. At that time, it seemed like the vast majority of students exclusively sought employment in large law firms. There really were no clinical programs to speak of, let alone financial subsidies and loan forgiveness programs to support public interest work. You know, those changes are very good ones, very good for students, very good for the legal profession, and I think very good for society. I think we would all like to see these programs and the opportunities that come with them expand in the years to come. My remarks tonight are actually inspired by what I'll call the public service silver lining that is emerging in the current environment. And what I will talk about is the overarching public service obligation of lawyers and the opportunities and benefits that public service jobs provide. As an initial matter, uh, I believe that as lawyers, we should broaden our perspective uh, on our public service obligation and deepen our commitment to public service, irrespective of the particular job that we may currently hold. More of us should consider careers in public service, uh, or at least aim to work in the public uh, sector at various stages of our professional lives. And more broadly, and perhaps most importantly, we should view our public service obligation as a long-term, continuous responsibility that guides how we conduct ourselves, whether working in the public or private sectors. I'll begin, uh, as lawyers often do, uh, by defining some terms. Uh, what do I mean in the broadest sense by the public service obligation of lawyers? I'll offer my view uh, that the public service obligation is something that should permeate everything we do as lawyers. Next, I'll discuss some of the unique and significant benefits of public service. And finally, I will encourage you in the Legal Academy to continue teaching and emphasizing the importance of the lawyer's public service obligation and its benefits to raise the bar for the performance of lawyers and to inspire an interest in a broader set of career choices for your students. Now, law is a service business with the emphasis on service. Our responsibilities as lawyers indeed center on ethical obligations related to the services we provide to clients, to the profession, and to the rule of law. And as Ben Heineman, William Lee, and David Wilkins recently wrote in their very thoughtful piece on lawyers as professionals and as citizens, there's a fourth ethical responsibility or ethical dimension for lawyers, and that requires us to generally provide our services in the public interest, in furtherance of a safe, fair, and just society. Now to be sure, some lawyers have pure public service and public interest jobs, whether in government agencies, the military, the legal academy, public interest organizations, or nonprofit work of various kinds. In those positions, the duty of public service is the essence of the job description. But this fourth ethical responsibility of public service for lawyers is by no means limited to those of us in public service roles. It applies to all lawyers throughout their careers, including private sector lawyers advising private sector clients. And it is an obligation that extends far beyond our still 
only aspirational duty to provide 50 hours of pro bono legal services each year. As Roscoe Pound, the distinguished former dean of Harvard Law School, so eloquently captured it, private sector lawyers have an obligation to practice law in the spirit of public service, in the spirit of public service. For me, that means that we're obligated to ask our clients the should or ought to questions and include those considerations in the advice we give. Or as Archibald Cox put it in terms we can all understand, lawyers should be willing to say to clients and say it, yes, the law lets you do that, but don't do it. It's a rotten thing to do. You know, Cox's point is obviously that our role as lawyers transcends the technical. It requires us to consider the public's welfare in addition to the interests of a private client. And that is how it should be. You know, perhaps if lawyers were better at fulfilling this aspect of our public service obligation, we could elevate our collective reputation and finally make some list of the most admired professions. A list where teachers uh, and members of our military always rightfully do well. Lawyers, on the other hand, tend to trail way behind, sometimes barely ahead of telemarketers and lobbyists. But you know, this was not always the case. Uh, lawyers, for example, played a central role, as we all know, in the founding of our nation and enshrining the values that guide our country today. Thomas Jefferson was a lawyer, as was Abraham Lincoln. They're more modern day heroes, too. A number from my field, for example, have been singled out, including former SEC Chairman Manny Cohen, who rose from a staff member to become chairman of the SEC and brought changes to allow SEC staff lawyers to provide pro bono legal services. And former director of corporation finance, Linda Quinn, who was both a giant in the securities bar and also the first woman to lead the division. And there are, of course, other heroes from our ranks. Justices Thurgood Marshall, Sandra Day O'Connor, and Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Their careers, even before they joined the court, centered on championing civil, the civil rights of minorities and women, uh, as well as a commitment to legal education and other public service. You know, a 2013 survey by the Pew Research Center's Religion and Public Life Project, however, paints a bleak picture of how our profession as a whole is regarded today. It asks how much certain professions contribute to society's well-being. Not surprisingly, 78% said members of the military contribute a lot, and 72% said teachers do as well. Lawyers, on the other hand, got a disappointing 18% endorsement, with 34% of those surveyed saying that lawyers contribute very little or nothing to society. That 34% hurts. Uh, and some of you may remember that it was actually the lawyer in Jurassic Park who the T-Rex chose to devour while he hid in a porta potty. <laughs> now, our image as a profession clearly needs work. Public service, though, is about much more than image. Uh, it is about lawyers being good citizens as well, as well as knowledgeable and well-trained practitioners. Personally, it has been one of the most satisfying aspects of my career whether in the public or the private sector. And again, make no mistake, private practitioners, not just public sector lawyers, need to absorb and really live the public service mandate in order to raise the bar on our real worth as a profession. The image part will follow right behind. Now, government lawyers and public interest lawyers are also bound by the public service obligation, but for them, it is their core mandate. I used to say to the young prosecutors who worked for me when I was the U.S. Attorney for the Southern District of New York, your conscience is your client, reminding them that as representatives of the public, they should always, always take the high road, both substantively and procedurally as they carry out their responsibilities. The same applies to the SEC staff lawyers with whom I'm now privileged uh, to work. You know, the primary responsibility of government uh, lawyers is to serve the public. And that is also their primary source of job satisfaction. I see that every day with the SEC staff and the high levels of professional accomplishment and personal pride that comes from the work that they do every day to protect investors, safeguard our markets, and facilitate capital formation, the tripartite mission of the SEC. You know, doing what you think is in the public interest every day and doing it in the most principled way is a sure path 
to professional and personal fulfillment. Very good work if you can get it. There are, of course, many other benefits and rewards that come from a public service job. I will highlight just three of them. Exposure to an important segment of our profession that contributes directly to the public welfare. Hands-on training and greater responsibility as a young lawyer. And the opportunity to work on cutting edge issues. When young lawyers ask me about a choice between a career in the public or private sector, I invariably offer the following advice. If possible, try to spend time in both. Even if you think you're destined to be a lifelong government or public interest lawyer, or to have a long career in private practice in a large law firm, it is still invaluable to experience as many different slices of legal life as you possibly can. You know, as young lawyers begin their legal careers, they may think they know, but they often have very little idea of what will actually interest them and engage them. So it is important that they take advantage of every opportunity available to them, especially early on. Exploring both the public and private sectors will steepen and broaden their learning curves. You know, our careers as lawyers, sorry, sad to reflect on this, but span many decades, often as many as 40 or 50 years. That gives us a lot of time to work with. So it is possible for your graduates over the course of their careers to seize any number of exciting and varied opportunities that come their way and ignite their, uh, their psyche and their motivation as lawyers. You know, this last piece of curbside advice is for the long term, too. More senior, or as I like to say, seasoned lawyers should look for opportunities also to follow their hearts and dreams, especially when they involve providing public service on a more full-time basis. Both the lawyer and the public will be the beneficiaries. At the SEC, for example, we've made an effort over the last several years to hire experts from the private sector, both lawyers and other market specialists. Our existing staff and the new private sector recruits learn from and complement each other. It unquestionably makes us a stronger agency and enhances our ability to protect investors and strengthen our capital markets. We also benefit enormously from those academics, market experts, and others with very busy day jobs who give of their time and talents to our various advisory committees. For example, in the coming days, we will announce the members of the Market Structure Advisory Committee, a committee filled with market experts and academics that will assist our staff and the commission in the very important work we are doing to comprehensively review the structure of our equity markets to optimize them for the benefit of investors and companies seeking to raise capital. You know, the opportunities really are many. Jobs in the government for lawyers uh, range from short-term consultancies uh, and fellowships to full-time positions and even presidential appointments uh, such as mine as chair of the SEC and United States Attorney. As a society, we need to attract talented, knowledgeable, and genuinely committed professionals to public service and work hard to remove barriers that discourage giving back, whether the obstacles are financial, structural, education, or something else. Of course, a major benefit of public service jobs for young lawyers is hands-on training and greater responsibility. There simply is no substitute for doing it to grow your competence and expertise. Trying a case, however small, is qualitatively different than serving as one of dozens of associates on the biggest antitrust or securities fraud case. Having done both, I know that both can provide invaluable experience, but I would argue that young lawyers find the most vertical learning curves in the public sector, where you can handle your own cases and where the decisional buck really does often stop with you. And some of my most meaningful and memorable learning occurred, no doubt about it, when I was the one calling the shots as a young prosecutor. You know, another significant benefit of public service jobs is the importance and the variety of the work. Prosecutors who worked for me when I was U.S. Attorney, as Carl mentioned, tried and convicted the terrorists who bombed the World Trade Center in 1993 and our embassies in East Africa in 1998. They indicted Osama bin Laden and investigated the terrorist attacks of September 11th. Others indicted and convicted major financial institutions for securities and other kinds of frauds. Enforcement staff attorneys at the SEC root out fraudsters stealing literally millions of dollars in complex Ponzi schemes and recover money for harmed investors who count on their investments to fund their children's educations or their own retirements. 
Others at the agency develop policy initiatives that enhance the resiliency of our equity markets and provide more useful information to investors before they decide whether uh, and where to invest their money. In other areas of the public sector, lawyers work to overturn unjust laws, exonerate the innocent, uphold our civil rights, or provide legal services to those who cannot afford a lawyer. You know, motivation is almost never, never lacking in public sector jobs. Indeed, the word that almost always pops up in discussing public service jobs is fun, uh, a priority that has become far, far too elusive and scarce in our profession. You know, the late uh, Judge Edward Weinfeld of the Southern District of New York, who routinely arrived at the courthouse before 6 a.m. and worked 12-hour days, put it this way, what one enjoys is not work, it is joy. And I have to say, I've been very fortunate in my career to chair Judge Weinfeld's view. Finally, and I really am trying hard not to sound so much like I'm on a soapbox, but when you engage in public service, every day you go to work, you have a chance to make a real difference in people's lives. As I said earlier, very good work if you can get it. So where are we? Thus far, I've urged that all lawyers recognize our obligation to conduct ourselves in furtherance of the public interest, whether directly from the perch of a public service job or by practicing law in the spirit of public service, asking and advising on those ought to questions. I've also made a shameless pitch uh, for greater pursuit of public service jobs throughout our legal careers. That brings me to my final point, uh, close to home, I think, for this audience, how I believe law schools contribute so vitally to broadening students' perspectives and deepening their commitment to serving in the public interest. Let me hasten to say that I would not presume to lecture you on legal education. That is your expertise and one that I deeply respect. Rather, I want to commend you for some of the steps law schools have taken to foster and promote public service and legal practice in the spirit of public service. I will be brief and again mention just three. Exposing students to opportunities and direct experience in public service. Providing encouragement and support for placement in public sector jobs. And teaching professional responsibility beyond specific courses on professional responsibility, but really as a permeating guiding principle. Law School Today's, as you know, offer a wide range of clinical programs, externships, and other direct opportunities for students to obtain on-the-job public service experience through working in government agencies and public interest organizations. I can tell you firsthand that the SEC has benefited greatly from these programs, as we have typically had law school interns from many different law schools working with us really throughout the academic career. I think last year we had some 800 students from more than 130 law schools participating in the particular programs we offer at the SEC. And our interns provide a real contribution to our work, becoming valuable members of our teams in enforcement, rulemaking, and other areas of the agency's responsibility. Most of our interns receive school credit, and many have come back to work for us on a permanent basis after graduation. You know, on top of providing such valuable direct experience while still in law school, law schools have also instituted several important and often creative programs to encourage and support their students' placement in public service jobs. These programs range from student loan deferral or forgiveness, which we talked about earlier, fellowships and direct grants for a public service commitment after graduation, to career fairs, symposiums, placement assistance, and public service mentorships. More broadly, law schools have increasingly established centers fo focused on ethics and professional responsibility to prepare students for the difficult and important ethical issues they will invariably face during the course of their careers. As typified by the Lewis Stein Center for Ethics at the Fordham Law School, these programs go far beyond ensuring that the curriculum has a course or two on professional responsibility. Rather, they teach what they call at Fordham a life of noble lawyering. These programs are a critically important component of a law school education that fosters a perspective that ethics and professional responsibility can and must serve as a lifelong guiding principle. It is a public service perspective that reminds students that our profession rightly demands giving something back, which is important no matter where law school graduates end up spending their professional careers. The benefits of this greater public service emphasis thus extends really far beyond providing first year jobs or a more diverse set of employment choices to law school graduates. The enhanced focus 
will return real dividends in training a new generation of lawyers on the importance of public service in all of its forms and fostering the critical values of a public service ethic. All of this will have a positive impact on how graduates practice and how our profession is perceived. And you know, as you continue such efforts, it's important to keep in mind that a career in public service should not be a hard sell to many of the millennials who decide to attend law school. There's a growing body of evidence suggesting that younger generations are generally more civic-minded and interested in community service than older, by which I mean my and certainly Carl's, and possibly your generations, and the one before yours, Carl, as well. Uh, there's also a trend of more law school graduates working in jobs that actually do not require passing the bar exam, including many in the public sector. And some foresee a growing demand for individuals with a law school education in the fields of, for example, health care, housing, elder care, international commerce, and digital security. We should try to capitalize really on all of these developments and opportunities as we think about the future of legal education. Although clearly easier said than done, surely it is possible to recalibrate our economic models for legal education, to harness the new normal for lawyers, including, I hope, a greater emphasis on and participation in public service. There is, in my view, no higher calling for a lawyer than public service. And each of you is engaged in perhaps the most important aspect of public service for our profession teaching, guiding, and inspiring young lawyers. You are the role models and primary drivers of how well lawyers will do in fulfilling their public service obligation. How well they do at that, in turn, will heavily influence what kind of society we will all have. No pressure there. Just know how important you are and how important the decisions you make about legal education at the crossroads will be. Most importantly, know how much the profession admires what you do and how grateful we are for the public service choice you have made for your own careers. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, if you have a question or two, I'm happy to answer. You need not, however, if you're on your way to dinner, right? <laughs> Okay. Yes, sir. So, uh, if you don't mind me asking about your day job. Sure. Uh, so, so, it seems like the last, you know, people have been critical uh, for performance in your first couple of years. How would you evaluate your sort of what shot well and what you have to do to do a part one of your job? Well, I mean, I think the, the SEC is an enormously important agency. I mean, obviously, to investors, to our capital markets. Um, uh, can't overstate the importance, can't overstate the breadth of the responsibilities there. I've, I've talked about our tripartite mission a little bit in the remarks that I made. Um, you know, I think the agency's accomplished a great deal, uh, both before I arrived and, and after I arrived. I mean, in terms of our rulemaking and on the policy side, um, you know, we have proceeded with a, a, and adopted, you know, many of the major rulemakings under the Dodd-Frank Act. Uh, we have, uh, reformed the way uh, money markets are structured, which was obviously an issue in the financial crisis. Uh, on the enforcement side, uh, you know, we had a record year uh, last year, both in terms of numbers of cases uh, and the amounts of money. I think it was over $4 billion. We got orders to return more than $4 billion, much of that to harmed investors. Uh, so it's a, you know, so I think the agency's done uh, extraordinarily well. But and in terms of criticism, I mean, that's, first, it's part of the job. Uh, I think I'm very constructive about uh, criticism, fair or unfair, frankly. I mean, you want to, you know, take it in, and obviously if there are areas that you can improve and do even better, you certainly want to do that. But, but I'm quite pleased with uh, what the agency's done since I've been there. Anybody else? Yes. Over here? <laughs> On the other oh, side. there you are. Sorry. <laughs> Stephen Hobbs. The lights here are rather yeah, bright. Yeah. Okay. Stephen Hobbs, the University of Alabama, where the SEC means something different. Yeah, no, I know that. I, yeah. I want you to know that when I testified in one of my appropriations committees, um, and I was asked a question similar to the remark you just made, I said, I tried to get that job, yeah. you know, but I got this one. So, okay. you know, it, it is open now, you know, yeah. commissioner. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> anyway uh, I, I'm inspired by your, your presentation, and, and certainly I've, I've written on this idea of public service for lawyers. Uh, but the, the, the challenge that I have is that 
it seems that our profession, we may really be losing the notion of profession in the sense that I think that particularly with the recent financial crisis, we see a lot of lawyers who were involved in, in the creation of that who didn't take uh, Archibald Cox's advice about advising people don't do it. And they didn't have really a, a sense of the public good in, in terms of the financial dealings they were doing. And, and I, I, I see that sometimes we get to be caught up in the idea of the morals of the marketplace, which is a, a long-held uh, notion that, that lawyers are becoming more uh, uh, connected to that idea of morals of the marketplace as opposed to the morals of the traditional notion of what we mean by professionalism. So how, how do you see a pushback against that tendency? Yeah, I mean, I guess I'd say a couple things. The one reason I do emphasize, um, although I was talking, you know, primarily about benefits of public service jobs and what it means to sort of serve in the public interest and uh, to serve the public, I really emphasize always um, responsibilities of the private sector lawyers. What, what is their public service responsibility? And that's obviously Archibald Cox's uh, remark. And, it, and it's a, you know, it's not so easy. You know, you sit there and you say, yes, you can actually do whatever it is you're proposing. The law is not violated. Uh, it comports with the law, but it really is the wrong thing to do. Uh, and that takes a very strong, confident lawyer to do that. I think it's the bar we all have to aspire to and hopefully succeed to, but it, again, it's much easier you know, said than done, I think. The other thing that's happened in the legal profession, and it's obviously, you know, it happens in a different way in the context of the law schools, is, and I think I said it in my remarks when I said, you know, law is really a service business, right? But, you know, the difference between it being a profession and being a business uh, because of all the economic uh, challenges that I think the legal market has faced for really a number of years is something that the law firms in the private sector and really all of us have to keep a very close eye on because, I mean, obviously we have to be realistic about the financial challenges, we have to deal with those, but what we really don't want them to do, whether it's in the law school, private sector, public sector, is to overwhelm us as professionals and, and the duties that we owe really to everyone, all of our clients and the public.